Hello and welcome to the Fit for Privacy podcast, the podcast for those who care about privacy. I'm your host Punit Bhatia and here we have conversations with industry leaders about their perspectives, ideas and opinions relating to privacy and data protection matters. Before we start, a quick disclaimer that the views and opinions expressed are not legal advice. So let's get started. You'll be glad to know that we have completed one year as a podcast and this marks the start of our season 2. In season 2, we will do things a little differently. Like, we will sometimes have two guests or sometimes the guests will interview me and at the other times, we will also bring influencers from fields like marketing or recruiting to understand how they see privacy. So stay tuned and enjoy the season two. Hello and welcome to the Fit for Privacy podcast. My name is Elin Chivo and today I am with Punit Bhatia. Punit, you're the host of this podcast, actually, the Fit for Privacy podcast, which I get to exceptionally host and steal your seat for this one episode. Punit, you are a leading privacy expert who focuses on guiding and coaching businesses and privacy leaders in terms of how they can comply with laws such as the EU's privacy law, the GDPR, uh, through online and in-person training and and consulting. Very important for this conversation too, you have authored several books, including Be Ready for GDPR, which is uh, rated as one of the best uh, GDPR books of all time by the Book Authority. Uh, And today we're here to talk about your latest book, which we've written together, and so that's why I'm sitting here today. Uh, And we've called this book AI and Privacy, How to Find Balance. Thank you so much for for being on your own podcast with me today, Punit. Thank you, Aline, for this wonderful idea that we will switch seats and you will ask me a few questions about AI and privacy and we will have different uh, conversation. It's interesting to be asked questions rather than to have the challenge of finding questions. So thank you so much and thanks for your kindness for this offer. It's a pleasure. And let's hope my questions are interesting then. So let's start with, you know, let's let's start by reminiscing a bit. Uh, let's talk about where this idea of this book came from and and, and how we, uh, you and I both embarked on the on this journey. If you want to share a little bit more about this. I hope we are in sync. If I recall, we were recording last January, last meaning 2020 January's mm-hmm. our own podcast when I interviewed you for a podcast interview in Brussels. And we spoke after that or maybe before that, like I have written books and you want said you want to write a book. And we said, maybe we should write a book. And I didn't pay any attention. I was like, OK, a lot of people say that. But I did little knew that you would literally live up to that uh, commitment or promise or proposal. And then uh, I think in April or May, maybe we got in touch again saying maybe we should write a book. Uh, I don't know if it was you or me. And then. Uh, I was still not convinced that we will, but we had a few conversations and then the topic and then we wrote the book. And here we are almost eight or nine months later that we have written a book. So feeling good. I yeah. I hope that's what you remember, because maybe you ha- we had spoken before, but I don't recall. No, I think that's uh, that's also how I recall it. And uh, I was uh, I think it's we were I don't know if it's luck or chance or just the life also changed since we had met, you know, with COVID and uh, maybe that was just easier to do it in a context like that. But uh, certainly there was an idea planted and then you kind of have a a feeling that it can work and you just do it. And it's not every day that someone knocks on your door and says, hey, we can be co-authors. So I think it was also a nice push uh, for me to to be convinced and just do it. Um, But uh, on your end, it's actually not the first uh, book that you write. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about how long you 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 think it typically can take to write a book. What's your writing process like? Because I've learned a lot uh, you know, writing this book with you. I, I, for me, it's my first. So maybe you have some 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 tips and tricks that, that you know you've shared with me that you'd like to, to share to our audience today. That's an interesting question. A lot of people say I want to write a book with me or with you, but that's leave, they leave it at that. And we followed it and pursued it. And having written a few books, I have developed a process now which allows me to write a book. I've written a book in 15 days. I won't recommend to do that because <laughs> then uh, it's not a good book. You're not putting in a lot of effort. And the longest I've taken is this book that we've written together. 
<laughs> that's around six okay. to nine months but uh, this is a good book from what i remember of what i've seen and what i feel like and even the be ready for gdpr i'd written about four months right from book in my head to book in my hand or maybe six months book from head to hand and coincidentally i have also ran sometimes something called a book writing boot camp in which we talk about the process that's the six stages you have an idea you conceptualize it you put it into a structure then you have a template done and from the template like we did it it was a matter of filling the template rather than writing the book and then yes we are into the challenging phase now that's taking our book to people because we've written it we've done a good job but unless and until people who read it it's no good and that's the most uh, challenging part i think yeah i think you you once told me uh, it's difficult to write a book but it's even more difficult you know to also so of course have people really read it uh, but i i certainly can recommend our audience to take a look at at your your courses on writing books because now at least i know that uh, it's really something possible. I know a lot of people find it inaccessible or you know difficult find it difficult to, to, to imagine themselves writing a book, but I think this really this really is useful as um, you know and liberating to find out that you can. Um, now let's talk a little bit more about the book itself and what's in the book and uh, you know what is your view on, on when, when it comes to these uh, uh, these two concepts that we talk about AI and privacy you know there are the challenges that we uh, that we uh, touch upon in the book and then maybe you'd like to to share your your view on on how both of them interact and maybe you could also, um, tell us more about the challenges that, that business leaders and, and companies have to deal with when it comes to AI and privacy. Well, I mean, the way I see is privacy is a challenging topic. And I think you usually use the word complex to describe GDPR. And then AI is not simple either. AI is even more complex because in privacy, at least we have a reference that's GDPR or any other law and say it's complex. We can't interpret it. So we have something to blame on. While in AI, we don't even have that. We have a few frameworks, but that's where we are. And then the proponents of GDPRs say, well, it's the gold standard. You can use it for AI. You can use it for robotics. But then there's the other side. The AI people say we, it's, it's different. And then uh, there are there's other school of thought who say responsible AI, ethical AI, which is a nice way of uh, integrating. But between the three things, people tend to get lost because businesses tend to look for clear, informative ideas saying, I can do it, I cannot do it. Now in privacy, you have lawyers who can help you, but in AI, there's no formal specification saying, how do you get it? And AI and privacy interrelate because some of the data that AI processes is personal data. And that's where the GDPR or other privacy laws kick in. So it's an interesting challenge or triangle in which people tend to you know, it's it's like a football, the ball going from one corner to the other corner. And uh, when we spoke, the idea was to solve it. When we deliberated, the idea was to let's find balance. And I don't know how we got inspired to find balance. But that word balance allowed us to write each and every chapter because most of the times we were saying, would it be balanced enough? Would it be a good view? So we saw the challenge of finding balance between this uncertainty and complexity and ambiguity that exists in this world. And we, I believe we've done a good job. What do you think? Yeah, I very much agree on what you say on the, the, the need for legal clarity and navigating an environment that's constantly changing where you typically lack balance, and it goes well with this analogy. I think that the, a big issue when it comes to new technologies is that, well, a lot of businesses want to adopt it, and then the law tries to catch up, but it's it's always a slower process. So you have this kind of race or this uh, gap in speed, uh, and then there's also the issue that, um, you know, the, the fact that it seems to be very technical and that you need very specialized knowledge to fully understand AI on the one hand and then privacy on the other. And I think we managed to not take the expertise out, but making it more accessible for people to, again, not in terms of content, but in terms of behavior or attitude, have that balanced view. OK, I'm in between somewhere. I understand a little bit of both. And that's a good start. Wouldn't you agree? Absolutely. All if right. I hadn't agreed, we wouldn't have written in that way. <laughs> Fair point. 
Fair enough. Uh, now, maybe one, you know, one way you can, we can continue that also conversation when it comes to to readers' interest. And so why do you think readers will enjoy the book? And, and how would you, especially, how would you like them to use that book uh, so that they can be, they can get that guidance? So, somebody, I mean, a lot of us have inputs. We have the frameworks, we have the laws, and everything. But what we don't have is an analytical perspective and an opinion on where do the two fit in? Which framework is good? Which framework is not so good? What are the drawbacks of each framework? And how do we extract the best of all the frameworks, all the laws, and then have a way forward, which is business oriented, meaning an approach that how can you set up a committee to manage your AI projects or programs? How do you evaluate your AI program apart from judgments like the legal says no and we want to do it, business wants to do it and having a fight in between or a tussle or a creative tension as we call it. So how do you solve these things? If somebody wants to solve these things on a practical perspective and as we rightly say in the balanced perspective, this can provide ideas and inputs. And what we've done is we find found a fine balance between sharing the content sharing the approach and not going too deep. Because if you had mm. gone into how to set up your AI department, how to set up your committee, we could have written a book on that itself. But we mm. chose to do that in chapters. So if you're looking for a quick, easy read that gives you a good perspective and gets you quickly started, this is the one. But coming back to how will you use it, there are, my opinion is you will read it first time and you'll get those ideas. And when you hit an AI project, then you'll come back to it saying, what did it say on that topic or what? who should I have on my committee? How do I need to evaluate my AI project? Should I do it uh, numerically, quantitatively or qualitatively? And we've given both options rather than saying go for quantitative and qualitative. We say both options are open. Maybe for this part, you use qualitative, this part you use quantitative and create your own framework if you need. And when you want to create your own framework, you don't want to start from scratch. You need uh, something like Legos to play with. So we're given the Legos to play with. So it'll remain relevant for a long time. That's yeah, interesting what you say. I, I really like Legos, so I'm sure, and I, I think a lot of people do. So uh, I think that would be very convincing. But more seriously, I think uh, I like what you said about uh, taking a first look at it and then getting back to the book, of course, but also that we, in each chapter, we try to look at a topic without you know having the space and, and that's not the idea to go in depth and then if you find that interesting as a reader you can always do further research and dive into the topic a little bit more and i think we do make that clear and it's uh, i think that's really uh, for an audience that has so much to read nowadays you have so much information flowing that it's maybe good to first take a, a bird's eye view and then okay Maybe this is something I need more to know more about. And maybe this is something I already know a little bit more about already. So exactly. Yeah. The idea was not to replicate that the information that's available already, synthesize it, put it in a structure, package it and give it to people to digest and read and have a perspective very quickly. Because if I ask or you ask somebody to say we go to a company and say you have to read the US framework, the Chinese framework, the OECD framework and the European framework and then do your own framework. The person would say, okay, I'll come back in three months. Well, you don't have three months. So how do you do it? The mm -hmm. essence would be just uh, read this book and maybe on a weekend and then you're ready for having a conversation next week. Mm, absolutely. Um, I want to go back to the content of the book a little bit more, uh, if that's okay with you. Um, in the book, we go over a number of scenarios and use cases. We call them scenarios. Uh, and in those scenarios, we list a number of principles, you know, that we came up with and defined before. And, and readers can apply those principles in their project. You have a background in the banking sector. Uh, and, we, you know, one of the scenarios, well, two of the scenarios are actually about the banking sector. Could you walk us through, walk, us, walk our readers through some of the, the, the points that they can pay attention to if they work uh, in that sort of environment uh, where AI is being applied? So you want me to give the book on the show? <laughs> <laughs> well, don't, don't spoil it. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't want to spoil the uh, perspective of reading, but the idea is there's a lot available and you need to synthesize and you need to look at AI from different perspectives. People tend to look at it from business or monetary perspective or a legal perspective. 
while what we have looked at is six different perspectives and that you need to balance out in your committee and if you look at it from those six perspectives then it's a balanced view and without creating curiosity the six perspectives are the legal perspective that is what does the law say the privacy perspective meaning what will the what will the consumer think about it then the human perspective is it good for people or is it against the human rights let's put it like that and then ethics okay i can do it but should i do it is it aligned with the values of who i am as a company and of course it needs to have a monetary aspect because if there is no monetary aspect there is no project and then the societal aspect meaning does it do something for the society can i leverage it like that and of course we have also defined principles and a framework around it and i think we have 10 principles and we put scenarios and what we done is we critiqued or uh analyzed each of the scenarios like if you are installing security cameras what are the pros and what are the cons per principle what are the elements you need to look at and then these perspectives allow you to have a 360 degree perspective on any topic not only ai and privacy but even other topics which are relating to technology that's interesting because we tend to have a very well not very but we tend to have a narrow a uh, mindset or world view when it comes to so many things and um usually taking you know multiple people with multiple backgrounds and and, and walks of life and expertise that can always always enrich uh you know what you think you know but you don't know or the known unknowns the, the unknown knowns etc and I, i like what you said about that that importance to to have this you know everyone brought into the same room and discussing and as you said you know every company has its own priority you mentioned it could be uh, financial of course uh, and but but nowadays you also have to position yourself not just with you know with just that one priority there's a, many more priorities uh, that you have to factor in um so i i think you know that that also makes me want to you know ask you to talk a little bit more about this framework that we are suggesting in the book uh, which uh, which is the do bono six thinking hats and i thought maybe you could give a, our audience a sneak peek into what this approach is about if that's okay of course i mean that's uh, we are fortunate enough to have this approach from de bono uh, i think it's edward de bono who coined this six thinking hats approach and i learned it about 15 years ago in terms of thinking because at that my moment i had become a project manager in it and business and i needed to think from different perspectives and it's difficult for one person to bring in different perspectives like we talked these six perspectives in uh, ai and privacy now for a small company who has three people or four people or maybe two people and they are innovative one is a developer and the other one is more business oriented you know you cannot have these six or seven perspectives and that's where the six thinking hats approach comes in the approach is primarily saying you take six different dimensions and in de bono thinking it's about neutrality positivity creativity emotions pessimism and organization so what you do is you wear a hat in the room it's basically animated when you have a white hat you're talking about the project in a neutral manner saying okay i have no emotions attached to it what is it and then you wear a yellow hat and you say hmm i want to only talk about the positive things what what does this project bring in and then the creativity is the green hat you put in and say okay how can we be creatively leveraging this project and doing more for the mankind and then emotional hat meaning i'm passionate about this and i really want to go for it what are my arguments and then pessimism meaning the black hat and then you say i don't like this project this is bad that is bad and that's the hard part and then the organization meaning how can we get this done what is it to be done and if you do that maybe in space of say 2 hours or 3 hours 15 to 20 minutes each of these hats what we will have is all the points listed otherwise what happens is even in a large group or a large company we tend to be biased because legal would consistently say this is legally possible or not business would say i want to go for it but if you are putting this perspective approach in context of the six perspective that we talked about you can have everybody talking about each one of those things and discussing factually rather than emotionally that's i found it very useful and when we had these six perspective the six thinking had somehow clicked in my mind and we suggested especially for small companies they can use it and even large companies brainstorm around these six perspective rather than thinking oh it's a business decision let's go 
Yeah, thank you for sharing a little bit more about the, the De Bono approach, a very colorful approach, as you will find out in the book. And you, you can see those, those models kind of being applied uh, for, you know, in cybersecurity uh, or algorithmic bias. They have those red teaming, blue teaming kind of systems. But I think this framework goes a little bit more in depth and, and takes, you know, more perspectives and more types of of roles into account. So uh, I, I, I think, uh, I hope our readers will uh, will find it useful. Um, now let's turn to maybe more informal questions to, to end our, uh, our little chats. Uh, what is your favorite part of the book? I think the whole book. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, if I have to pick and choose, I would choose two. The one part that we work together and we looked at all the frameworks or all the key frameworks on AI that exist and we reviewed them and said what are the uh, pros and cons of each framework. It was enlightening because we were able to put in a, our opinion and of course a perspective on where each framework is strong at and where other it is not so strong at and that concluded or re-emphasized the need for this book meaning Every framework is good and every framework has some things which need to be added on and you need to create your own framework. So that was one part. And second was the creation of the framework because, okay, with so many frameworks existing, how do you create a framework which is different? I mean, uh, you remember it probably that the initial idea was let's also create a framework like the frameworks that is have 10 principles. But eventually we managed to create a principle based along with a uh, judgment based as well as a perspective based and then a quantifiable approach. So it balances out all dimensions because people need to talk. We need to give that space and then people need to analyze and have some numerical analysis as well. And both are valuable. Mm. Well, I, I agree very much with you, but uh, um, I, I was hoping you will you would not ask me the same question because no, I was in about to ask you the same question after your reaction what is your favorite part because i mean on one hand book is like your sibling or your child and you don't mm -hmm. want to say this part is favorite or this sibling is favorite mm -hmm. but uh, we are humans and we tend to have preferences and biases so it's no harm in saying this is my favorite part well i got the chance to share a little bit more about the the part that i like the most in, uh, in this other episode we've done about the book, but I think this we had one in common. It was uh, this framework that uh, that we built, but particularly that part where you came up with, you know, you took everything and you, you came up with this structure of this idea of roles within organizations. And I thought that it really gave a, a very concrete kind of ending almost or, or finalization of our work that really th I, I felt when I saw it, when I read your, that part, for the first time before reviewing it, I felt, well, this is really coming together. And I really saw, uh, I really consciously could tell, oh, that's the purpose. And that that is going to be very helpful for readers. Um, now, you you took the analogy of the, of the child. Uh, you know, if you have a friend, um, it's not that you want to change people. When you love them, you don't want to change them. But, you know, the book is a friend, let's say, well, she... Okay, it's a book. It's not. It's not a child. So you can still want to change something about it. Well, you won't. But unconsciously, you still have a part you prefer or, or would like to change. So what is something you'd like to change in the book? Oh, that's interesting. I mean, hmm. if I had a part, I would have changed it. At this moment, mm -hmm. I don't have any part that I would change it. Maybe six months or one year or two years later, we will have an idea. Some law comes in or something comes in, and I would change it. But at this moment, as we release it, I'm fairly satisfied with what we produced and the level it is. Because it is exa it's exactly what I envisaged and a little bit better than what I envisaged, I would say. I don't know how you see that. I agree that uh, we've we've written about something that moves extremely quickly, uh, both on the policy side, the technological side. So. Yeah, we, we will probably need to have another look at it in one or two years and perhaps, you know, do an update on some things for sure. Yeah, it goes so fast that, uh, yeah, that's a good answer. I thought I was putting you on the spot, but uh, well done. Um, and I, have no, one. I tried to reflect back and say, what's your idea? <laughs> so you also did a good job. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Uh, my final question would be uh, about your, you know, your next project. Do you know what is the next book you'll be writing? Or maybe you're currently busy with something. Hmm. There are a couple of ideas I'm working on. 
there was a book I was writing on the Personal Data Protection Bill of India, which I couldn't complete or I completed, but I did couldn't publish because the law didn't get published and I wanted it to be in sync with the law. So I think in coming months, the law would be approved. And as it gets approved, I will refresh my book where it's needed and I will publish that. And on a completely different topic from privacy and AI and all these things, I'm writing something very, very different. That's called a, a book around philosophy or why we do certain things and how we do certain things. The title is not yet finalized, but I have this philosophy called ABC for joy of life. So, I mean, OK, it, it gets philosophical, but it's like. We tend to be taught A for apple, B for boy, C for cat, but that doesn't help us in our life and mm -hmm. we need sometimes to a support system. So I have an ABC, A for action, B for belief, C for courage and so on till Z. So uh, in essence of time, that's what I will develop. And another philosophy I act on is think, believe and act. That is think about something, then believe it's doable and then just go for it. Because especially in book writing, that's what I've learned. When you start at start, you think I can't write it. It's very difficult. But when you do it chapter by chapter, mm. hour by hour, and you don't realize in six months it's done and it's like a therapy. I, I agree. And it sounds fascinating what you're busy with. So thank you for sharing it with, with me and, and our audience and uh, our future readers. Uh, and thank you for uh, being with me today on your podcast, Fit for Privacy. Thank you all for following us. Uh, Punit, it was an honor uh, to be on this podcast with you a few times now and a uh, really great experience working with you. Thank you all for listening to us and stay tuned for more with our book, AI and Privacy, How to Find Balance. Thanks for listening. And now we ask you for some help. Take a moment to subscribe and review this podcast. Your support matters. And if you have done it already, thank you so much. Now, if you have questions or suggestions, drop an email at hello at fitforprivacy.com. And finally, if you know someone who will benefit from this, share this podcast with them and help us grow. Thank you so much. Stay safe and see you next time.